Welcome everybody. This is the Microsoft 365 platform community call. It's the first call of the 2022. Is that the right way of saying that? I guess it is. So uh, it's really weird. Uh, it will take again two months to understand that the year has changed because I have no idea where 2021 went. Uh, it feels like 476th of March 2020. Anyway, uh, so my name is Leslie Ivanen. I'm a uh, program manager in the Microsoft 365 platform side of the house. What we're going to do today uh, is that we're going to do a quick update, a typical set of slides uh, on the latest updates on the Microsoft 365 platform side of the house and the news. Um, then we'll have the group photo uh, with the Microsoft Teams together mode. Uh, so that should be all uh, said and done. And we have Seb on the call uh, showing again how the together mode dance is being done. Right, Seb? Putting on a spot. Excellent. So thumbs up. And then we have James Kay uh, starting uh, with the demo section, roughly 10 past or so, uh, as an introduction to Microsoft Teams ISV app monetization capabilities. So, really focusing on uh, those new options which we have available for Microsoft Teams ISVs. Um, and then we move to SEP. Uh, SEP is going to talk about again about the Microsoft Graph toolkit controls, but a specific control this time. To be honest, I don't even know what is the control he's going to talk about today, um, but we'll see when we go to that demo. So, what we want to do on the two just to recap on that one as well, uh, because the MTT Microsoft Graph Toolkit is really, really, really powerful. And uh, so we are covering a one step at a time each call uh, from this moment forward until, let's say, a, is it March or April, somewhere up there? Maybe. I don't know how many controls there will be at that time. Um, one control per call. Uh, and thank you, Seth, for that. Those are really, really cool demos as well. And then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the new adaptive card samples for Viva Connection Quick View Design. So a quick talk on the on the Viva Connection, the mobile experience is what is the ACE components and then the designs, uh, which are based on adaptive cards, which are now available for everybody to take advantage for a kind of an inspiration, what can be done within the Viva Connection mobile experience. Uh, let's start with a few uh, typical slides, just to recap on the, uh, on the on the assets. And I'm laughing for the COVID standard time. That was the reference which I did when we started on the on the March uh, thing. Thank you, Todd, on that. So uh, we have two YouTube video channels. We have the Microsoft 365 developer video channels, where we have official videos uh, from Microsoft side of the house, and also coming from the cloud advocates, who are of course Microsoft employees as well. And then we have our community uh, YouTube channel as well. Two historical reasons we have two of these. And uh, don't worry about it too much. In here, uh, we have all of the recording uh, recordings of the community calls and also the individual demos from these community calls are all available in this video channel. We have a lot of open source assets available for Microsoft Teams, Graph, uh, SharePoint, and all so on. Uh, we have multiple sample galleries available, so making it easy for you to get started on doing development in the Microsoft 365. And if you're wondering that there's too many assets, too many things to remember, don't worry about it. It's AKMS M365 PMP from where you can find all of the documentation, guidance, samples, YouTube channels, everything what is available around Microsoft 365 is, will, is on that location. We are actually in progress moving our blog post uh, potentially there as well. So we're trying and reorganizing that site to be a bit more, let's say, welcoming um, for those who are arriving as a new person to Microsoft 365 platform because it's pretty overwhelming. There's quite a few uh, services and applications and development tooling available. So we're trying to make it easier uh, for everybody in the future. Now, um, Few reminders, uh, which we typically do on this course as well. I know that these are repeats for some of you, but it is super important that people are aware of these things as well as, to, as we get new people arriving to the Microsoft 365 development. Uh, you should absolutely sign in and register to Microsoft 365 developer program, where you get a free E5 developer tenant uh, and with additional demo assets. So there's demo content available within those tenants as well. And you can, this is a free way of uh, registering there. Uh, it's going to ask your email and phone number just to validate who you are. And then you get a free tenant uh, to support your development experiences. And as long as you use it for developer purposes, it's going to renew automatically in 90 days. Um, so it is not obviously to be used as a production tenant. There are instrumentation inside of the tenant to detect how it's being used. So a bit of a warning for everybody on that. And uh, we also have a lot of, lot of uh, cool Microsoft Learning Guide available, so specific learning modules available, and these are actually really, really good training materials. So they start from getting started, uh, the basics, and as you go them through, they are from one hour to I think eight hours is the longest module, uh, longest learning path. Um, you will actually learn everything related, everything meaningful related on that particular topic. So really great uh, getting started uh, tutorials for sure. 
And if you're wondering how would I find all of the different samples which are available from Microsoft or from the community, if we are about to truly officially release with the blog post Microsoft 365 sample gallery, uh, where we have already 640 samples available, which is a pretty mind-blowing uh, number. Uh, so you can go to a one location, you can use the search, um, you can target to a specific product, so you can only talk, target, for example, Microsoft Teams uh, samples or, let's say, uh, Office samples, and you can filter the samples based on that. So really, really awesome asset for everybody to take advantage as well. And then uh, if you're wondering on other ways, how would I get started? Um, that's why we have David Warner uh, on the call uh, to introduce you on the Sharing is Caring initiative. Awesome, thanks, Vesa. Yeah, friends, this is an opportunity for you to get involved with the community, whether it means that you're going to utilize the resources that are available, all of the resources that Vesa just showed, or you'd like to contribute back or improve them, upgrade them, all of those opportunities are available to you, but we understand that there are times when those hurdles may be in place that prevent you from doing that. Like, I've never created a pull request in GitHub. I've never actually presented the demo on a call. I would love to do any and all of those things, but I'm a little nervous. This is a program that provides hands-on guidance on how you're gonna be able to do that. So that means that it is a safe space opportunity where you will work alongside members of the PNP team and others in the community to do exactly what you would like to do to get more involved. They're all free safe space opportunities, not recorded, scheduled throughout all of the months and are available to you to register for now. aka.ms forward slash sharing is caring. We've got a PNP search AMA coming up next week right after this call. So get scheduled, start off 2022 in an awesome collaborative way. Again, all free, we invite you to sign up. That's it, back to you. Excellent, David. And just for the uh, for the context, uh, PMP Search is an open source initiative for creating enterprise search components, which are then using Microsoft Craft behind of the scenes by default, or then falling back on the classic experiences. But they give you an opportunity of uh, designing and creating an enterprise search portal. Uh, they are open source, um, and in that show next week, um, in that event, uh, then Frank Cornu and Mikael Svensson from Microsoft, Frank Cornu from uh, Canada, uh, are gonna talk about uh, how to get started, um, and also if you have any questions related on that initiative. Now, on other assets, uh, we do have two uh, related uh, Microsoft 365 developer related podcasts. Uh, so of course we have the Microsoft 365 developer podcast with Paul and uh, Jeremy Fake, uh, which is the Microsoft 365 developer podcast, uh, where typically they have a new uh, podcast entry uh, released once a week or bi-weekly. And uh, also because of the holiday season, uh, they have been also on a break. And then the second uh, podcast is with the Wildec Mastercards and me, uh, which is the BNP Weekly, uh, which focuses also on the latest on the developer platform, but uh, also a more broadly on a non-development uh, topics as well and there's typically a visitor here as well well both podcasts or uh, typically have a visitor in their shows. Now, on this week on the updates, there was only a one news article uh, which was released within the last uh, week, uh, which is as expected because we are pretty much now coming back from the holiday season. Um, but that was the What's New in the Microsoft Teams December 2021 edition. And these are really great blog posts, which are basically summarizing the latest announcements which have happened within the last month uh, related on the individual products. Uh, typically, this is released, this kind of a blog post is being released for SharePoint and for Microsoft Teams and the SharePoint one isn't yet out, it's probably coming out later today, and then the Teams one is out already. On this one, uh, just to call out, uh, there was the order of raised hands, which is really, really cool feature. So when people are raising hands in the meeting, in the larger meeting, it might be really difficult to know which of the persons actually raised the hand first. And this one uh, is covered in there. There's Teams meeting recordings improvements, uh, like the transcriptions and, and uh, you can actually uh, listen to recording in a faster format as well, if needed, or slow down the discussion or the speed as well, if needed. And then there was end-to-end -end encryption option for one-to-one -one Teams calls, which is really cool as well for those who are looking into those things. Now, before we go to the actual demo chat sections and uh, the real stars of the day, James and Seb Sebastian, uh, we'll do a quick uh, group photo uh, with together mode. So let me actually start my recorder here. Clearly, everybody is enabling their video. They know how this actually works. Well, one second, uh, I will flip the together mode on Teams. And whenever Teams, okay, there we go. It starts looking that we're getting a people. Let me flip the scene so we're not always looking like that. Let me, let's do some jungle feelings. Uh, it's a new year, so welcome to the jungle. 
and let me enable my camera if there's enough time for me to do that. And I will click the recording button. Let's wait three, two, one, and wave some hands. And thanks everybody for joining. Awesome to have you all on the call. Thanks everybody. These are really fun to take together and share as part of the blog post as well and in the social media. Thanks everybody. Really, really cool. Excellent. So I will move that away from there. And there we go. We're pretty much on the schedule, which is pretty cool as well. So let's go on the actual topics and demos of today. As said, we're going to start with James. We go to Sebastian, and then on last, I'm going to talk about the Viva connection side of the house as well. But James, take it away. Thank you, Besa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever from you are joining. My name is James Skay, and I'm coming to you live from Kirkland, Washington. I'm part of the Microsoft Teams engineering group. Uh, and I'm currently working with some initiatives related to monetizing Teams applications. Um, and earlier this year, we had some uh, announcements that were made at Build and Inspire, uh, kind of culminating, if you will, the ability for uh, third-party developers and ISVs alike to monetize uh, Teams apps. And so we're really proud and excited to share this great opportunity today. Everything that I'm about to share with you has already been GA'd and announced uh, late last year. And so I wanted just to kind of give a sample for this group around what capabilities and options are available. So to kind of take a step back, and I know some people are like monetized Teams apps make sense, but how does it come together? Well, if we think about there's two components that we're bringing together, and they're the Teams app store that I think we're mostly all familiar with today. And there's also the Microsoft App Source, or the web app or the transactable SaaS offers created. Now, many of you are saying, well, Yes, we've had this before, what's new? Well, we've now taken the ability to create a transactable web app in App Source and link it directly together with the Microsoft Teams app and to bring it together into the Microsoft Teams app store. So for many of you, this might look new because prior there was just like an add button in the Teams store when you did a search for a particular app. And so what we've, what we've done is we brought a buy a subscription button straight into the Teams app store uh, that will actually allow you to transact straight within the Teams App Store, as well as the Microsoft Teams Admin Center. And so with that, let me go ahead and jump straight into a demo. Um, as you can see here, I am in my Microsoft Teams client. I just happen to be on the web client, but this works identically as well on your desktop. If I go into my App Store, I can actually choose to look for a particular application. In this case, I'm looking for an app called Contract Zen. And you can see here I can add to team or I can buy a subscription. Now, if there was no transactability available on this app, this buy a subscription button would not appear. But because there is, I can click buy a subscription right now. Now, what you'll notice is two things here. Uh, I can choose uh, either a monthly, a per user per month basis, or a per, per user per year. But also there's a 30 day free trial that's available. And so that's actually pretty cool that our ISVs are enabling our users the ability to test out before uh, an actual charge begins. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and choose the $9.50 uh, per user per month. And I'm gonna choose to buy uh, 10 licenses. Now I can choose to buy a license for myself, but I can also choose to buy licenses for my company or even just for my team. And in this case, you can see here that I've already entered my, my soul to information. There's my name, my company name, and I've also added a Visa card here. And so what I can see here is that it's gonna be a $95 order uh, that's gonna take place. Currently, the total is zero because I have that 30-day free trial. So at this point, I'm gonna hit place order. And in the background, we're actually transacting business through AppSource as well as through Microsoft's backend systems. And what's gonna happen soon is in just a moment, I'm going to be prompted to set up my subscription and to provision it directly with my ISV. And so at this point, it's preparing that setup link right now. And in just a moment, I'm going to click and I'm going to land on the landing page for Contracts in where I'm able to set up my application. Now, in this case, I bought 10 licenses. And so in just a moment, I'm going to be able to assign those licenses to those users within my Teams tenant. I need to just give some permissions here based on 
the acts are the actions that are required through the ISV. This is uh, no different than what's typically required today for uh, permissions from tenants. And in this case, I can actually choose to give a name for my uh, organization as well as to select a country. So in this case, we're located in the US. I'm going to save this information and then jump straight into contracts in. And in just a moment, I'll be able to, as I mentioned, assign those licenses. Now, while that's going on in the background, I also want to show you another capability of how this can be done. Uh, you'll notice here, this is the Microsoft Teams Admin Center. And the same thing can be uh, done from here. I can click on Teams Apps and then go to Manage Apps. Uh, here, you're going to see all of the apps that are available for Microsoft Teams. A shortcut to see what's available for transactions is I can click on uh, the License tab and sort that based on purchasability. Now, what you'll notice is there's a lot of other ones that are available here too. Uh, in the event that I wanted to purchase one, like a uh, breakthrough as an example, I could choose to purchase this here under the plans and pricing. You'll also notice that this has a 30 day free trial here. Uh, and so in this case, I could choose to uh, do $3.75 per user, because I have, let's say 50 users, I can click on purchase. And at this point, the same thing that's going to happen, but there's going to be one distinction that is different. In this case, I can actually choose not to charge it to a credit card, but rather I can actually choose to um, create or do invoice billing based on a purchase order. And so all that information is coming straight from here uh, with regards to a billing profile. And so what's great about this is for IT pros and IT admins that wish to actually buy larger subscriptions for their organizations, they're able to do so straight from the Microsoft Teams Admin Center with no credit card required. Now with just a few moments left, I wanna just talk about how does this take place and what is an ideal candidate for this? These are just some high level points, but sometimes these can actually help spark ideation. Uh, Partners that have a, an application already today that provide some level of stickiness or value, something that makes my usage of Teams that much more simpler or easier or efficient. Uh, you support a per user per month or a per user per year model. We currently don't uh, accept consumption based or flat rate. You can also differentiate between a freed and an in paid app experience, as well as you can build and implement a license management component uh, which was that second part of contracts that I didn't show you. Now, how do you make this happen? Uh, actually, before I do that, let me jump into why. Uh, I think most of you who are in this space may have heard back last year, we lowered our transaction fee from 20% to 3%. And for many cases, that's cheaper than processing the credit cards on your own. Uh, Microsoft will only uh, keep 3% of that revenue and give 97% back to the partner. And then last but not least, from a why perspective, we've just announced uh, financial incentives, $10,000 for building a high quality app within the uh, time and constraint of this program, which is October 1 through June 30. And then if you can get hit another 5,000 commercial mile within that same time period, you get an extra 10,000. So an opportunity for you to earn up to $20,000. From a high level perspective, there's five steps. Create your free Teams app, you integrate with your SaaS fulfillment APIs, you create that transactable offer in Partner Center, you link that transactable offer in Partner Center, and then in the Microsoft uh, Teams Dev Center, you submit for validation, and then you're good, you're, you're good, you're gone, you're live. Now, with that said, how do you get started? URL today, aka.ms slash Teams monetization slash get started. And with that, Faisa, back to you. Excellent, thank you, James. Um, if you don't mind, uh, there's a few questions on the on the chat. Uh, do you do we we can follow up on them offline? Uh, we can jump on set right now, or do we want to have a few of them right away? Either way, I'll go through the chat right now. Cool. So uh, James will answer on them, and then Seb, your turn. Awesome. Thanks, James. Thanks, Vesa. Let me share my screen. There you go. Thanks everybody. Thanks uh, Vesa for the opportunity. Um, hi everybody. My name is Sebastian. I am a senior program manager on the Microsoft Graph team. Today we will be going a little bit a little bit deeper into our endeavor or journey to um, understand all the different components that are creating the overall experience of the Microsoft Graph toolkit. 
Before we go into the specific component of today, I want to do just a quick recap of what is the Microsoft Graph Toolkit. So first, the Graph Toolkit is a collection of reusable and framework agnostic components. But also we provide authentication provider for accessing and working with Microsoft Graph. Think about the Graph Toolkit as a super easy way to get controls dropped into your web application that are automatically bound to Microsoft Graph. So you don't have to do all of the calls. You don't have to do any of the interactions with Graph. We provide them out of the box. The components are fully functional. They are customizable. And today we're gonna really, really focus on that customization story. And they work with any framework and work on all modern browsers. What does it mean? It means that if you're using plain HTML, you're more than welcome. If you're uh, using React, you're more than welcome. Same thing with Angular or Vue or any other um, HTML or JavaScript framework. It also works on any type of modern browsers like Edge, Chrome, Firefox, Opera, or any other browsers, even the ones from the mobile. So why would you use the toolkit? First, it really cuts your development time. I'm a very lazy developer. I don't like to code something that was already made a thousand times before me. So I love to use something that is already available out there. That's exactly what the Graph Toolkit provides by just adding UI components to any of your web apps. It's beautiful, but it's also very flexible. It means that if you're building something that looks like M365 or you want to make it part of a Teams app and really have the look and feel of Microsoft Teams or of Microsoft Outlook or even integrated within Microsoft SharePoint, well, you can. It's out of the box. It's all there. We're built on the Fluent UI. We're built using the same standard as other um, applications of Microsoft. But if you need it to be fully customized, you can also do it. So you can override all of our customization and all of our styling to make it a little bit different. And it works everywhere. So you want to host it inside a web app. You want to host it inside a Teams tab. You want to host it inside even an Electron application. You can do it anywhere. So today, what are we going to talk about? We're going to, uh, last week we discussed the login component, which I would consider it our foundation component where you log into Microsoft Graph. So that way you, you get, you obtain an access token that you can use to connect to Microsoft Graph and do really cool things. Today, we will be focusing on the MGT person component. The MGT person component is really used to display a person or a contact by using their photo, their name, their email address, or any other uh, specific person details. We will be doing that into our HTML sandbox um, that I will share all the code at the end uh, on my GitHub. And let's give it a shot. So let me close that guy here and let me go um, right here in my code. Um, I have an index of the HTML. That's where we left the last time or approximately where we left the last time where I have a very simple HTML. And let me maybe zoom in a little bit. I have a very uh, simple HTML file where I have very limited styling in here, where I have my provider. My provider is what provides access to Microsoft Graph and my login component right here that provides the login capability. So the button that I can click on and connect to Microsoft Graph. So let's just look where we were last week. So right now I'm here. I have a message that says, it seems you're not connected. Please sign in using the MGT login component. And if I click sign in right here, I'm going to get a prompt where I'm going to be asked to sign in with my, in, my, in that case, with my demo account. And automatically, I'm being redirected. And I have a nice login component where when I click on this, I see what's my name, what's the email address that I'm using. It's great. It does not provide a lot of value. It provides connectivity to Microsoft Graph, which is why we're here. But how can we really push it to the next level? Well, today we're going to talk about the MGT person component and how we can really use it in a way that I would say is super, super, super useful 
for everybody to build an app. How many times have you been building an app where you wanted to just bring like the avatar of someone having the name, the title, you always have to build these pieces um, in different apps. Every app has that same feeling, having that specific UI with like uh, a face file or a bunch of people next to each other. That's what we were gonna uh, do today. So the first one I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, do some, a little bit of a cooking show at the same time, uh, where here I'm gonna paste in my first example. So you can basically ignore this. This is really just to make it beautiful, right? Like an example div and a title uh, div where I put in what this sample does. But the real magic here is here. MGT person, the person query is me. So the beauty of these controls is that they are aware of who you are and it can understand that by doing a call to Microsoft Graph to only get the components or the information that is relevant to the me object, meaning the user that is currently connected. So when I control save here, we're going to see the default experience of the MGT person. Let me go here and then actually let me do this. And I'm going to just do that right here. So that way we're going to have them side by side. So here you see we have the same web experience, but now just underneath you have the user right here with my face, when I hover on top of it, there's a tooltip with my name also. So all of these components are also built with accessibility in mind. So first, that's great, delivers somewhat a value, but sometimes you want to see more than just yourself, right? Um, so let's go and use maybe a component where we can actually look for somebody. So here, I'm going to use this example here, where we're going to have an MGT person where the person query will be Alex Wilbur. So think about this as a search capability, where you can just drop in a name, drop in an email, drop in a user ID, and automatically MGT will be able to understand the context, use that, call graph to get the results back, and then afterwards, when I hit save, automatically, I'm going to have Alex here being shown right here, right there. Right now, I have AW. It automatically got the, um, the letters from the initials. Actually, if I do a hard refresh here, I should get at some point. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to check why I'm, I don't get the pictures here. But I should get the picture also of Alex Wilbur in that case. So that's a second example. If you want to be a bit more specific in what you want, you can actually specifically ask, hey, I want a person query, let's say Megan Bowen in that case, but I don't want the avatar. I really just want the initials. I want to force it to be the initials. And that's why you can always um, use these attributes to really customize the way that the MGT person component will behave in this situation. So if I hit save, automatically Megan should come up here. It's interesting why the um, images are here. I'm gonna have to, or they're not here. I'm gonna have to check why this is not happening, which is um, actually quite interesting. Um, I know I'm running on a tenant that might be uh, dying. It's an over one year old tenant, so. That might be the reason why the images are not uh, coming back. Not too bad. Afterwards, you always also have the ability. Now we're looping in one single user at a time, but there's always ways to bring multiple users at the same time. So for example, you can do this and have multiple MGT person next to each other. We're going to see a, another example of this in, in a future component on how we can actually make it happen in a simpler way. But sometimes this should uh, could work with providing the value. So now if I hit save, you see, oh, now you see Megan showed up. Um, you're going to have all of these different components side by side. We're saying a little bit earlier that it is possible to customize the look and feel of some of these components. Well, here you see that I, I've set a custom class here. It's called face file. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just go up in my styling. I'm going to add this style. So I'm going to say that 
Um, for the class face pile, when you are in an MGT person and you're not the first child, I want to move it slightly to the left. So bring it negatively into the margin. So when I'm going to hit save, you're going to see how beautiful this is. This is an experience that we see a lot in M365 on a Teams channel or even in SharePoint with the members of a site. So you can really customize it. And here we're not doing any sort of like black magic or whatever. We're really just using CSS to be able to, to position all of our components next to each other in a little bit more, I would say, beautiful way. Now there's other ways that we can also work with the person component. One of them being to define the component, but fill it using JavaScript. Maybe your data is coming from a call to the Microsoft Graph, and you want to, let's say, display the manager of someone. You won't be able to do slash me slash manager like this, for example. That's not going to be supported um, or yet. Um, so how would you do that? Well, you can always use the following. So let me place in an example right here. So for example, I'm going to set an MGT person that has nothing, so no queries, no details, no whatever, but I'm going to specify an ID of manager. So how will I actually use this? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go at the bottom of my page where I have a script tag. In that script tag, I'm going to add a function. That function will be load manager. And let me just uh, zoom in a little bit on that one while we're here. The load manager function will validate. Here, am I already signed in? If I'm signed in, it means that I can call into Microsoft Graph. And here, I will be able to grab the authenticated Microsoft Graph client from our JavaScript SDK. This means that I can call any endpoints on Graph that has been pre-authorized, and I can afterwards play with its data. So here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to call the API slash me slash manager. I'm going to get the results from that API. And then with the result, I'm going to set the user ID of this element. This element here is our manager, right? Is the, the, the MGT person uh, component that is here. I'm going to set the user ID. What is HTML elements? don't have user IDs. Well, usually they don't. So why can we do that with the Graph Toolkit? Well, the Graph Toolkit creates all of these components as web components. So we really enrich the DOM, the HTML DOM of our page with new properties, including user ID. So now I can get the ID from my results, in that case being the manager, and I'm just going to set it to the user ID. And automatically, because there's a new property that was set on the control, automatically, it's going to reload, do the call it needs to the Microsoft Graph, and afterwards, just display the right result. So if I go here, and I make sure that when I'm uh, actually, I'm going to just put it in here just to make sure that I'm when I'm signed in, I'm going to load the manager. So automatically, I'm going to load the manager. As soon as I'm signed in, I'm going to call into that function. I'm going to hit save here. You're going to see that when I'm going back here, now my manager is Megan. So it found my manager, it got the right user, and now I was able to emit a call to Microsoft Graph to grab this person directly from here. That is really cool. So let me continue with another scenario that we can do with uh, the Graph Toolkit and the person component. So let me go right here. Now we have seen a lot of examples with just the face of persons, but I think it, it's relevant to do more than that. So let's look at all the options that we have. The first one being, that I want to see a single line of information. So when I hit save on this, you're going to see that now the me component brings my name. So it really brings this experience where I can see the name of that person. But I can also do, you know what? I want to see 
two different lines for that person. So let me add another sample where I just say, I want to view two lines. And now if I go here, I see my name. We see that the avatar just went a little bit bigger because now when we're looking at two lines, we want to maybe use a little bit more screen uh, real estate. So in that case, I can show the name and the, the, uh, the email that was provided. These are all defaults in MGT. So we automatically display the name of the person, the full name of the person, the email, and the third one, which is when we're using the three line, is the title or the job title of that person. But let's be honest, sometimes that information is not what you want to display to the users. So what do you want to do? Well, you want to use some of our properties that exist natively on the MGT uh, person component. For instance, the line one property, the line two property, and the line three. So if you don't specify any of them, we're going to go back to defaults. And if you specify one of them, we're going to use them as a way to get access to the data. So now you see I, I have added the given name. The given name is basically my first name, my job title as the line two, not the line three, and the line three as my mobile phone. So now if I hit save, and it's reloading quickly, and now you see Sebastian, senior program manager with these here. So you see how customizable the component is. You really can match whatever you want based on the properties that are available on Microsoft Graph. But let's say that your data is not necessarily all available on Microsoft Graph. Maybe you want to do kind of a mashup of data from Graph and data from somewhere else. Well, how can you use this component to display data from a an hybrid scenario or even from a fully disconnected scenario? Well, one of the ways you can do this is to use our person details. When I go here, you're going to see here, well, I'm going to use the three lines. I won't be fetching an image. I'm going to use the mail of that person, which is parker at contoso.com. The display name is Parker the Porcupine, and the job title is the PNP Hero. So this is a fully disconnected. It could have been um, fetched using a, um, an API. Maybe it's hard-coded in your app. You can do whatever you want with this. But then when I hit save on that code and I reload, now Parker the Porcupine is here. So you can really bring the data and use MGT as a way to make sure that the UI stay consistent, even though if some of the data is not coming from Microsoft Graph. So that's really cool. Now, what is even more cool is if you can get a little bit more context on the user. Now you see Seb and everything, that's great, but I might want to see more about that person. We have a sidekick to the MGT person component, which is only available when you're using the person card property. So you know when you're in M365 and you hover on top of somebody's name, you often will see a person card showing up. Well, here, that's exactly what we provide also as part of MGT. And we see them really, really sitting next to each other. So when I'm going to hover on top of um, my face, I will be able to see more details about that person or about a remote person to get who they are reporting to, who is reporting to them, uh, their files that are shared with you, the emails you're interacting with them, some also other uh, details about that person. So when I hit save here, I'm going here at the bottom. Here, when I hover, oh, there's a new thing here. I have Sebastian, the name of the title of the person. We don't show yet the email. You can send an email. So you're going to have a mail to It's going to open up directly in Outlook or whatever the client you're using. You can start a chat. It's going to open up an automatically Microsoft Teams. But also, I can do this. And now I can find information, much more details about this person. So here, a couple of files. Now it's my screen that is a little bit too zoomed in in that case. But you can go here. You can see all the, uh, the structure, who is reporting to who, uh, the files, 
the user information, all of them as part of that super simple ways of just saying, hey, I want to have the person card. We're going to cover the person card in a future component spotlight, but I wanted to show you how powerful this is. Now, let's talk about really powerful. What's the one thing you want to know when you're looking at somebody, at somebody's face? You want to know if that person is currently available, and that's exactly what you can do here. So you can use the presence, and automatically we're going to query for that user's presence. So let me go here, and let me go into Teams, just to make sure I'm, I'm logged into Microsoft Teams. Ah, oh, yeah, that's exactly it. I, it looks like I'm... That tenant is in a weird state. I'm so sorry for that. That's not, that's not too bad for now. Um, as we're going to see it, it's offline, but it would work if I was uh, fully connected. So let's pretend I'm connected. And now here, it says that I'm offline. But if I was connected, you would see a green one. If you were uh, busy, you would see the, the red dot. So you will really be able to see that information in a super, super, super quick way. Something I mentioned earlier, with, I, which I think is key to our story in MGT, is to be able to custom style our components. So let me start with this. So I bring back a simple MGT component with three lines. I'm gonna hit save, I'm gonna go at the bottom, and now basically regular component here. Nothing crazy, just the same thing. But as you can see, I'm using the custom style class. I don't have a custom style class right here at the top. I, I don't have that. So how do we do custom styling with MGT? Well, let me show you. You will always be able to use the following. So I'm gonna do a mgt-person dot custom style. So basically what it means, it means that any element, any component called MGT person that has a custom style class will apply these styles. And we offer by default a set of overridable variables that you can use to customize a style. I mean, let me show you a set of them right here. And I'm going to reference all the, the documentation just after this, where I can say, you know what, my avatar, I want it bigger. I want to have a border. I want to have a different radius than what you provide. The, the, the initial color, I want them to be green. Um, the background needs to be this one. The presence color is different. I want to have a bigger font. I want to have a different line three. I want to have a different line two. I want to have more detail spacing. And when I hit save, now you're going to see that my super customized um, MGT person is now very different, very uh, Christmas themed, looks like it. Um, but in this case, it truly really provides all the value that you need be between having a very M365 look and feel, but also having whatever you need look and feel for your application. So the last thing that I wanted to mention today is not only you can do custom styling, but you can also add custom events. If you want to code a little bit more and really go super deep in the customization options of um, MGT and the MGT person, you always have the ability to go in, create an MGT person. In that case, I specify the specific ID so I can reference it. Um, and now I can just say, hey, you know what? In my JavaScript, I'm gonna go at the end of my JavaScript here. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do a document. I'm gonna select my custom events which is the one I just created. And I will be able to say, you know what? When someone clicks on the line one, I want to be able to, in that case, I'm logging something to the console, but I could launch a new app, uh, alert something, go to the next screen or whatsoever. So you can really customize the experience. So when I hit save here, I go at the bottom and let me open up my, here, that's what I want. And if I click on the first line, you're going to see here that I just pasted in the information that I got from Graph about this specific person. So you have the entire data that is coming back from Microsoft Graph. So wanted to stop here for today. Uh, let me go back to slides just for a, a moment. A um, couple of resources 
our repo for uh, for graph is ak.ms slash mgt. All our documentation is available on ak.ms slash mgt slash docs. And if you want to look at the um, the samples I'm creating for this specific series, you can always go to aka.ms slash mgt slash sandbox. I hope this was useful. Back to you, Vesa. Excellent. Thank you, Seb, on that one. So let me actually start sharing my screen and we'll start jump on the last demo of today. Now. We do have 13 minutes, and uh, that should be sufficient uh, to do a quick introduction on the new adaptive card samples for Viva Connection Quick View Designs. And that's a lot of, lot of words in a long, long, long title. So let me actually explain what this is all about and how the adaptive cards uh, associate and how they are actually involved in the Viva Connection and what is a Quick View Design as well. So we're going to do some demos. Uh, you'll see some new designs which are available, but let me quickly just start by quickly explaining what this is all about. So Viva Connection is being extended or being supported uh, to extend uh, using the SharePoint framework. So technically it's the same SharePoint framework which you can use to extend Microsoft Teams and SharePoint, um, and you can extend the Microsoft Viva Connection uh, with the same familiar tooling and uh, the same automatic code hosting, uh, which is one of the key benefits of the SharePoint framework for sure. So you don't have to set up an Azure website or AWS website to host your code. Everything is hosted automatically in Microsoft 365, which simplifies things with single sign-on and all of that stuff. Now, with Viva Connections, it's basically a few different experiences. Um, so most likely you've seen uh, or you might have seen the Viva Connection different experiences, but I wanted to recap this uh, briefly. So we have the desktop experiences, which are on the left side of the slides, uh, which is basically the SharePoint uh, portals and the Viva Connection and uh, Viva ex experiences exposed through the Microsoft Teams um, in the desktop or in the in the tablet mode. And then we have the mobile experiences. And especially today, we're going to focus on the mobile experiences. Uh, quite often, though, people are a bit confused on what is this mobile experience is all about? Why would I care? What, why, why would I actually start building this kind of thing? So I actually created a few new slides on explaining what this is all about. So the Microsoft Viva Connection mobile experiences is really around uh, providing you your company mobile portal. So this is technically, uh, if we if we think about SharePoint and portals built on SharePoint, now we can use the same platform, same technical tooling to create a mobile company experience, which is natively designed for mobile experiences. So you can easily access your business assets uh, from the mobile devices. Uh, it is optimized for the mobile experiences. So you, you basically see, as a, let's say, a limited set of buttons and limited set of functionalities by default, because again, it's optimized for a smaller device size. And then if needed, you can always open up the actual application to get full view and depending on your device mode. Uh, of course, the mobile uh, a portal uh, is fully personalized, so you can define the logo, you can define the, the experiences which are being exposed here, um, and it's extendable uh, by using the SharePoint framework, Adaptive Cards, and Microsoft Graph. Um, and this way, you can then build your own uh, mobile experience, which is targeting frontline workers, and why not actually normal workers as well, you know, who are moving across the, who are not always sitting right next to the desktop. And that's that's where the whole experience is kind of shining. The Viva Connection uh, is also part of your normal E3 or E5 license, so it's basically and uh, there's no additional license cost. So you can actually start using the Viva Connection uh, already today or start piloting usage of it. Technically, if we think about the Viva Connection uh, model, so the Viva Connection uh, development uh, is really three layered uh, for the mobile experiences. So the UX layer, uh, which is highly flexible, um, but it is a bit uh, limited, uh, is using adaptive card markup. So you can basically design the native mobile experiences in adaptive cards. And the reason for this one is that we're using optimized uh, mobile first the native rendering rendering engine for iOS and Android experiences, which makes it really fast and snappy rather than rendering everything in HTML and then converting that to be mobile native. Um, then we have the SharePoint framework in the middle, which is responsible technically on coordinating um, what is being shown 
in the UX layer. And then when somebody clicks a button or uh, clicks a button which loads additional data or we're flipping between the views, then the SharePoint framework is the one which is orchestrating what happens. And then of course, SharePoint framework is also responsible of hitting the Microsoft Graph and other APIs for surfacing information. And, and you can now, of course access on-premises data through Azure. You can hit other APIs as well, but Microsoft Graph is the by default, uh, the API surface what we're using. Now, what we wanted to do uh, as part of the design guidance uh, for Viva Connection is to provide also sample adaptive cards. So some of the existing uh, or the, let's say in quotes, older adaptive card designs have been pretty, let's say uh, simple. So what we've done within the past months, actually, uh, with our design team uh, is, that, is that we've been creating new designs, showing the art of possible with adaptive cards. So really kind of a showing that you don't, you're not limited on a simple card. You can actually do real, really cool looking stuff with adaptive cards as well, uh, which is basically being demonstrated uh, here within these uh, images as well. And I'll show you where all of this is being uh, available. So let's have a, a few live demos on what does this actually mean in practice? How, do, how are those adaptive cards being exposed in Viva? Uh, also where you can get them and also how it looks like even in mobile experiences. Uh, we do have time for that as well. So let me actually go back in my browser. And, and first of all, the Viva connection. Uh, so if we are in the desktop view, the Viva connection uh, is being exposed through the Microsoft Teams and we can actually see the dashboard in here. Um, if we, um, as we start designing these experiences and mobile experiences for Viva connection and especially for the mobile, it's all about using the browser UX or creating the experiences which are then being exposed through the mobile device. And I'll show you the mobile device experience in a second, but for a content editors and designers of the native mobile portal, you basically have this really easy to use browser tool where you can then go and add a card. And from the card, based on what has been installed on a tenant, you'll see a different set of applications being available. And we also have introduced this card designer, which is basically there to give us some flexibility on designing adaptive cards. Now, what do we have available? And uh, what are we actually, how do you start using uh, these example uh, styles? So first of all, in our documentation, and uh, let me zoom in a bit, related on Viva Connections, uh, we have the Viva Connection uh, uh, documentation uh, available, which explains how to get started on extending a Viva Connection. In that doc documentation, uh, within the past, weeks we released additional guidance related on uh, the design guidance uh, for Viva Connection and especially focusing on the card designs and quick view designs. So what are the considerations as we start designing uh, these kind of cards and experiences which are natively mobile first? Uh, by the way, I'm going to update that GIF animation pretty soon. Uh, but basically walking through the different options and what is the anatomy of the cards and what are the different kind of quick view designs. Now, Pictures are always nice, but wouldn't it be cool if you can just easily take any of those samples which are in the pictures and start using them within your implementation? And that's precisely what we've basically done here. So as part of the uh, github.com slash PMP adapted card templates, we have now introduced all of the different designs which our design team has kind of a, well done within the past months, showing the art of possible within the designs. So what does that mean in practice? We can go, for example, the samples. Um, thank you, Jim, for the reaction. And we can go to a simple list, which actually isn't the super simple list. Uh, this is a relatively uh, complex adaptive card design, which looks actually quite pretty. And I can come in here and I can see the native adaptive card uh, design in here in the adaptive card format. And that means that as a developer or a designer, I can basically take this design I can just crap it uh, and I can, I'm, I'm going to copy that. Uh, notice that all of the URLs are pointing to files in a GitHub, so they will just uh, magically work. I can go to the adapted card design views and designer in here, and I can paste in the card uh, in here and voila, we actually have uh, the cool looking adapted card available uh, within uh, adaptive card designer. So I can actually then start modifying this based on my needs or requirements uh, as needed as well. That's pretty cool. Now, what I can also do uh, is that I can actually take those into account and, and start using them as part of uh, the card designer as I'm designing the experience for mobile first. And that means that 
we can then, for example, have that holiday card. Uh, we can define the settings and images, custom images, uh, what's going to happen with the actions and the template uh, JSON available for that. So let's do that quickly. Uh, we might actually go one or two minutes over time, but that's fine uh, for those we are recording uh, this call. So let me actually do that for the particular card which we just uh, showed and what we see. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to create an, a large card. I'm going to do an uh, an example uh, from the one of my screens. Uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to actually take an icon, uh, and this is a praise card. So what we're going to do is that we're going to use some sort of a nice praise icon for it. So it, it's going to present that uh, over there as well. Then we're going to modify the title. So let me actually change that title to be uh, something like praise. We're going to modify the heading, and let's get that one over there as well. And uh, so icon, uh, we're going to actually make it as an image and I'm going to put a custom image on it. So I'm going to change that. I'm going to upload an image uh, from my file and let me go in here. Let me actually find the right uh, image file from uh, here. So I'm going to actually take that uh, image. I'm going to add that one there. Uh, and then uh, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to define what's going to happen when somebody clicks the buttons and what kind of buttons are actually available. So let's hide the buttons for now and let's uh, say that show a quick view. So we're going to do this kind of an imaginary praise application. This is not a real application because we're missing the application which is reacting on the buttons and actually loading the data. But now what I can do is that I can actually go um, again, on the GitHub, this is the praise example, which we actually had in here. And I can copy this data. I can go back on the dashboard. I can go to the template JSON, paste that in, and we are basically good to go. So now as I do publish, let's double check that the settings are fine. I can actually see the praise card. And as I click the card, we can actually see that design to be exposed uh, into dashboard as well. And that is basically then being uh, well, available for the end users and available uh, for the mobile experiences as well. How will that look like in a mobile? Well, here's a, a bit different tenant, um, but it's mobile experience. Uh, so you can actually see that it's mobile Android, uh, which is designed for that particular tenant called Rilla Cloud. You can design different experiences here as well. Um, but as it's being rendered in a native mobile, it looks exactly the same. And that's really the reason why we're using adaptive cards. Uh, so we basically have exactly the same experience in a mobile and in a desktop experience, which is really, really cool. Now, these are intended to be used as an innovation, as an inspiration. Um, and on top of them, uh, you will still need to do actual work behind of the SPFX. Uh, so, you, so loading the data and having the data available. I will paste in the links for all of these assets uh, and the resources uh, in the chat in a second. But the whole point of this one, again, uh, is to get people excited on the art of possible uh, based on the work what has been done uh, by our design team. Cool. Let's actually go back on the uh, slides of the day and we're going to close up the call uh, after that. So thank you, James. Uh, thank you, Seb. Uh, well, and, and me as well uh, for a quick demos of the day. Really cool stuff from James and Sebastian at least, and hopefully the adaptive card uh, uh, stuff is interesting for you as well. Um, we have a lot of calls available uh, as part of our community efforts. So first of all, the Microsoft 365 platform call. This call happens in every single week on this exact time. And then on top of day, we have a few additional calls. And then on Thursday, 7 a.m. Pacific time, we also have a recurrent call. Uh, so two calls at least in every single week. The recording of this call uh, will be available within 24 hours at the Microsoft 365 community YouTube channel. And the easiest way to catch up on those new recordings and videos is always to subscribe to Twitter or follow up us in LinkedIn or in Facebook as well. And the next Microsoft 365 platform call is happening on January 11th. But thank you everybody for joining today. Thank you uh, one more time for awesome demos, uh, Seb and James, and we'll hopefully see you in our next call. Thank you. Bye-bye.